Welcome, thank you so much for joining us. We'll get started in just about one minute. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for partnering with families to affirm children's languages, cultures, and identities. My name is Carolyn Corlott. I'm the Director of Dual Language Learner Programs at Early Edge California, and I'm joined here today by our partners at the Sobrato Early Academic Language, or SEAL, and we're so excited to be able to provide you with relevant family engagement tools and resources as part of our multilingual learning toolkit. And today kicks off our three-part webinar series for pre-K through third grade educators of multilingual learners. And as you'll see, this will be an interactive webinar with prompts for you to share your responses in the chat. And we'll also be sending a follow-up email with a certificate of attendance and links to the materials so that you can access them after the webinar. And also please feel free to share these resources out with your colleagues. And I would now like to introduce you to our presenters this afternoon. We have with us Patricia Montes Pate, Program Coordinator, and Corey Wexler, Program Coordinator at SEAL. Patricia and Corey, I'll now turn it over to you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Carolyn. We are so thrilled to be here with you in this very important um, session. As Carolyn said, my name is Patricia Montes. Pape, and I'm here with my colleague, Corey Wexler. And on behalf of our organization, I just want to express how grateful we are to be able to connect with you in this way. We're just um, very passionate about our dual language learners and English learners, and are so glad to engage in this virtual forum with you on what it means to center these children and their families in your early learning spaces. We'd like to start our session by just inviting you to share one thing that has made you smile this week. So please in the chat, list one thing that has made you smile. Oh, of course, the kids, they're so wonderful, right? Being with family, oh, fostering three adorable puppies. The weather, of course, is so wonderful. Yeah, it just wants to make me be outside actually right now. <laughs> but still excited to be here. Your dog, the mask mandate lifting in the district. I know it's been so long. Like, what do we do without those masks, right? Working with supportive coworkers. Ah, oh, I can attest to that as well. Um, coworkers, the children, students. Oh, thank you so much. And please keep dropping this in. It's so wonderful to start off on a positive note, just reminding us of those, those precious things that, um, you know, make a smile and, and, and how important it is to pause to appreciate these moments when they occur. So thank you so much for engaging in that. As I've said, both Corey and I work for SEAL, which stands for Sobrato Early Academic Language. We are a nonprofit organization committed to ensuring that all dual language learners and English language learners learn, thrive, and lead. For over a decade now, we have worked to disrupt inequity in the education system by placing dual language learners at the center of our work. And we do this by partnering with public education agencies across the state to transform their systems through professional learning and technical assistance. And by advocating for state level changes that focus on the needs of dual language learners. To learn more about our organization, we encourage you to um, visit our website at seal.org. But SEAL is also honored to work with Early Edge and be a part of the Multilingual Learning Toolkit and the collaborative effort that took place in bringing together many wonderful research-based instructional practices that will support you in meeting the needs of your multilingual learners and their families. It's a wonderful online resource. We hope that you've had the opportunity to explore it. And if not, that's okay. That's what this webinar and the upcoming webinars are all about, just making it accessible to you. 
So as you see here, I'll just quickly share that the toolkit is organized into 11 instructional topics, ranging from family engagement, to home language development, assessment, and more. And then under each topic, you'll find a wide assortment of research-based key principles, instructional practices, and accompanying resources to support educators working with young multilingual learners. Over the course of the next three months, we will be offering webinars that focus on three of these instructional topics. So these sessions are designed to introduce you to several of the strategies you'll find in this toolkit with the hope that this will launch you into a more in-depth exploration of the amazing online resources you'll find there. So today's session focuses on family engagement and how critical it is to partner with families to affirm children's languages, cultures, and identities. So we know that from a very young age, children begin to internalize societal messages about who or what is valued in our communities. And it's important for us to recognize that schools have tremendous power, status, and influence in reinforcing or shattering these messages, making it critical to design early learning spaces that are not only reflective of, but center the languages, cultures, and identities of the children they serve. But we can't do this alone. Families play a pivotal role in this work. They are their children's first teachers, they know them, ground them, and guide them in so many ways. And it's impossible to truly create rich, affirming early learning spaces without the support of families. So today, we'll begin by talking about mean, building meaningful family school partnerships, and then we'll explore how to nurture and develop a shared understanding of the value of bilingualism. And then finally, we'll explore some of the resources and instructional strategies you'll find in the Multilingual Learning Toolkit that really help center children's languages, cultures, and identities. So to ground us in today's topic, we are going to share a short clip that is part of a longer video you'll find on the website under Family Engagement 1A, gather information on each child's language, culture background from parents upon enrollment. So the video is called Affirming Language, Culture, and Identity. And as you watch the clip, we want you to consider these two questions. So how do children see themselves reflected in the environment? And what role do families play in creating an affirming learning environment? So for your reference, these questions are posted in the chat box. And again, I encourage you to just type in your thoughts and observations as you're watching the video. So as you see examples of how children are being reflected or you have ideas of how parents contribute to the classroom environment, go ahead and type those into the chat box. A key part of identity, a key part of experience, is our language. And for dual language learners particularly, coming to school with a language other than English and being immersed often in an English world, does the language that I know have a place here, does the language in which I express myself understood here, invited here, but even if they do understand the language of the teachers, that sense of who I am and my language is very, very important. This is such an important part of early childhood that it's actually written into many of the foundational principles and tenets and even standards and preschool foundations that we work from as a field. <laughs> Underline all of these is the understanding that children need the confidence and the competence and the sense of empathy to really reach across differences and to really know who they are. It's sharing something really important, and then it's also us getting to know each other in a really important way. Would you like to hear those stories? Well, Honda said he would like to hear stories, and I know that you all have been talking to your families about the story of your names, and I'm wondering, does anybody want to share with Mohandas the story of your name? Jada, would you like to share the story of your name? What did you bring? Come up here. Why don't you show everybody, all your friends. So what is that? That's my, my mom's necklaces her grandma gave to her. 
And what is that necklace made out of? It's called Jade. Is that what you're named after? Wow. So Jada was named after Jade. the Jade, which sounds like it's very important in your family. This was your grandmother's necklace? Wow. Ay, qué bonita. Rita, Rita, tu pelo para el lado para que te lo veas. Agárrelo bien. Ahora usted, Luis. Y ahora usted. Ok, vean su pelo. Tóquense el, no, ve, de, tócate el pelo. A ver, Luis, haz tu pelo para el lado. A ver, Rita, haz tu, tu colita para el lado para que te lo veas. Mira, Luis, ¿se parece a tu pelo? Sí. ¿Sí, ¿Sí Luis? ¿Quieres escoger este? Ok. Ya todos tienen su pelo, agarren material, ustedes van a compartir y luego les voy a dar su proyecto para que le puedan poner su pelo. Cristalí, ¿ya todos tienen? Ok. So, ahora aquí, vamos a hacer esto, niños. So, a ver, y descríbeme el pelo que escogiste aquí, ¿está qué? Está duro. Duro, muy bien. A ver, ¿dónde, mi amor? Este está suave, muy bien. Emily, ¿tu pelo es qué? Resbaloso. Resbaloso. ¿Y qué color? Um, el café. Suave. Café. Café, muy bien. Okay, so I'll just give you one more minute to finish typing in some of the observations you made or ideas that you had as you're watching the video. So we see lots of observations just in terms of the language that was used um, to interact with the children, to engage in some of the learning experiences, obviously bringing in books and songs too that reflect who the children are, where they're able to make connections. Uh, excellent observations. Teresa wrote sharing the stories of their names and family heirlooms. Wonderful way to just make children, you know, uh, aware of who they are, share their pride in who they are, and then also get to know their colleagues or their peers. Wonderful, lots of great observations. Important for students to feel culturally accepted by their teacher, absolutely, acknowledging their background and who they are. Thank you, thank you so much for your con contribution. Please continue to um, share those with, with everyone. Okay, so today we'll explore what it takes to create this kind of rich, thoughtful environment that centers the experiences and families of our dual language learners. So I'm actually going to turn it over now to my colleague who's going to lead us in this next section. Thanks, Patricia. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really lovely to be with you today. Um, I want to offer a brief framing for today's work before we get into the weeds of this stuff. So we all know that California is home to the nation's largest population of dual language learners, with nearly 60% of children in California under the age of five living in homes where a language other than English is spoken. The majority of those um, children speak English at home. However, there are at least 59 other languages represented in California schools. So many of our classrooms are rich with multilingual, um, are richly multilingual. <laughs> um, years of research has confirmed over and over again that undermining home language and elevating English has a tremendous negative impact on children's social identity and their ability to develop strong, positive relationships with family members. It also directly affects how successful they are in school. Conversely, this research has also confirmed over and over again the importance and benefits of home language development. We know from this research that home language is crucial, strong homeschool connections are essential, and that affirming caring relationships and environments impact development, motivation, and participation in learning. These three are deeply interrelated and dependent upon one another. So we're gonna begin with um, starting to unpack what we even mean by family school partnership. 
This research that I just mentioned is very clear that linguistic and cultural continuity between home and school supports children's development and learning. And the two-way partnerships between the home and school are essential to creating that congruity. This two-way relationship shifts the dynamic from teacher as the sole holder of knowledge to viewing families as also being the holders of knowledge. Families bring with them a wealth of wisdom, including their language, their identity, their history and life experiences. They have stories to share about their lives and perspectives, and they bring with them a wealth of skills that unless we're actively seeking to know about, might very well go unnoticed. So I'll just share a short story with you. During a community workers unit, I asked children to share about their family's occupation. This was something I had sent home as a family conversation, which you'll hear about um, a little later on. And Jamie shared about her mom working in a local um, pizza parlor. And all the kids got really excited about how lucky Jamie was that she got to eat pizza all day and what a cool job that was until a classmate mentioned how sad it was that all her mom could make for her was pizza. Because I had taken time to get to know Jamie's amazing mom over the course of the year, I knew that she did indeed work in a pizza parlor and that before moving here to California, she was an engineer back in Guatemala. And for now, this was the job that allowed her to still take her children to and from school. I arranged for her to come into the, to the class and share about her work. And it's here that we learned that there's so much that goes on in a pizza parlor and that Jamie's mom was actually working on fixing their ovens and looking for ways to make their takeout containers more environmentally friendly. And so I actually invited her back for another unit on recycling so she could talk about that aspect as well. So you see incorporating family knowledge into the classroom and curriculum gives these amazing opportunities to really enhance the learning community. Send, connecting with families in this way is really essential, and it's what we mean by an ascent based approach. So where does this work begin? The first step toward this meaningful partnership is that teachers make a concerted effort to get to know each and every family. This isn't at all a new concept, and for those who are in the early learning field, it's certainly a strength of yours. So returning again to the multilingual learners toolkit, when you click on family engagement, several subcategories will pop up and you can see the first two all, are all about gathering information about children's languages and being in conversation with families about the language and learning goals they have for their children. And so you can see that there are a lot of resources available here. Two resources are these interview templates, and both offer a wide range of questions that can help guide these conversations. In this first Head Start document, you can find a range of questions about the children's language background, and then even more specific questions about their experience with their home language and with English. And there are then a series of questions about the individual characteristics of the child, such as, what pretend activities does your child like? And what does your child like to talk about? I mean, just imagine if you have those insights to your children, how that changes how you see them as they're moving around and interacting with their peers and with the adults in the classroom. The language learning project languages and interview interview on the right offers another set of prompts to pull from, including who all lives with this child, with your child? What languages does the primary caretaker speak? And what language did your children learn when they first began to speak, right? So really getting nuanced and really learning, the, learning their story, including the complicated story of the relationship to different languages. So we encourage you to pull questions from these and from other interview templates and use them as conversation starters with families and use them throughout the year. So you're just continuing to go more deeply and to really get to know your families in these thoughtful um, and meaningful ways. Besides these conversations being the building blocks of relationship building, how can this knowledge inform the classroom and curriculum? So I just shared with you the story of Jamie and her mother, 
right? So learning about, for instance, the different jobs that family members hold sets teachers up to feature family members as experts throughout the year, including perhaps on a unit on community workers. Collecting information about the various languages spoken sets teachers up to invite family members in to be featured as language experts in the class. And we will also be talking about this in a moment. So when you connect with and nurture your relationship with families in an ongoing manner, you are building a trusting foundation from which you can really partner. One critical role you play as educator is that of home language advocate. Knowing the powerful impact home language has on children's success, it is really important that you're in ongoing conversations with your families about this, unpacking and debunking the pervasive and harmful myths surrounding language <clears throat> that so many of our families have internalized is really a key part of this partnership. In order to engage in meaningful, thoughtful and respectful conversations with families about this super complex issue, it's necessary to first build that foundational trust. And then as part of deepening that trust is being, is being able to engage in these res in respectful conversations about language that honor families' experiences and their desires while also challenging these harmful myths that are internalized. So I'm curious what you have heard from family members about home language and bilingualism. So as I read these myths out loud one by one, please note in chat the ones that have been voiced by family members that you've worked with. So for instance, as I read the first one, learning two languages confuses children. If this is something you've heard expressed by a family member at any point in your career, go ahead and type number one in chat. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna slowly read out these myths. And again, you can, you'll just go into chat and you'll type the number if you've heard this one. So number two, speaking their home language will hinder children's development of English. So type in number two into chat if this is something that you've heard, that speaking one's home language will hinder children's development of English. So I'm seeing a lot of people going into chat right now saying, yep, these are things we've heard. All right, so how about number three? English is the only language necessary for success. I mean, even as we're reading these and you're all affirming that you've heard them, like there's a heaviness to this, right? These are really puni punitive, oppressive, um, ideas. Number four, English immersion is the best way for a child to learn English. Yep. So like even with all of the research that we've been collecting over the past bunch of years, right, the last 20 years or so, it's so pervasive. And finally, what about number five? Children will maintain their home language while they learn English. Yeah. You're all typing in number five. I see that. Mm -hmm. So I just want you to take a moment to notice what's coming up for you in terms of how you see these messages impacting your children and families. And really perhaps how, how these messages have impacted you personally in your life, in your journey, right? It's, it's very profound. All right, so I wanna call out six research findings that regarding bilingualism that directly counter the myths that we just talked about. One, all children have the capacity to learn two or more languages. Two, although languages can be learned at any age, it's during the ages of zero to seven that children can develop near native-like proficiency in multiple languages. Three, the research also shows that having a strong home language supports children in learning English. And I really wanna emphasize 
the relationship. They're like puzzle pieces, right? The stronger the home language, the tighter the fit with the English. The English will be able to be acquired and developed more easily. And as soon as you start to pull that puzzle piece of home language away, English becomes much harder. Okay, the next one for all languages, whether it's English, Spanish, Korean, or any other language, children need exposure to competent language role models. So we have to think about who are those language models. And lastly, and this is so critical for everyone, including families to be aware of, studies show that early exposure to English can result in the loss of home language. We need to be really sensitive to that. So this is the research that needs to inform our work and should be at the forefront guiding everything we do in our programs and practice and in the interactions we have with children and families. As part of debunking these myths and providing them research-based information, families also need to know the benefits of being bilingual. There are so many negative connotations associated with bilingualism at this point. So as we've mentioned, it supports healthy, positive identity development. It helps keep families united and contributes to fa strong family units. It has tremendous linguistic benefits. Um, as children are able to use all of their linguistic repertoire to make sense of the world. There are clear cognitive benefits in bilingual children, including bilingual brains being more apt for multitasking, for example. By attending to the use of home language, we're setting them up for being bilingual in a world that often provides economic compensation for those with bilingual skills. And as we look to their future, Research shows that bilingual students are less likely to drop out of school, more likely to go to a four-year college, and engage in a wider variety of sectors of society, therefore equalizing their access and participation. So what we do in these earliest years of early childhood education and early elementary school has a huge impact right, on these later years of schooling. So here lies the challenge. How, and I'm really posing this for us to think about, it's like a seed that I'm planting for you to think about and talk with your colleagues and as a program, how do we engage families in respectful conversations about home language use and bilingualism and share this research while simultaneously really honoring their experiences and desires? It is in this space that we're truly engaged in a two-way partnership. As a home language advocate, you're juggling two equally important pieces. One is that it's so important that you're sharing accurate information about the importance of home language and its benefits, and that you're gently guiding them with this research. At the same time, families must feel you're interested in understanding their perspective, their hopes and dreams for their children, their concerns, right? They must feel heard and respected. Families have so many reasons for wanting their children to learn and speak English, and these must be validated. So again, the more these conversations occur within the context of a trusting relationship, the farther, farther these conversations will go. And so I want you just to, um, I'm just looking at the prompts here. Okay, so I just want to invite you now to think about what is one thing you would like to learn from your families or a conversation that you would like to have with your families? Again, thinking like over the course of a year, there are all these opportunities to be engaging with them. So what is something you would like to be learning and knowing more deeply about the families that you're working with? If you would go ahead and chat into chat and just share what's coming up for you. Mm, beautiful, Anna. Just basic, basic, most important, how can I support you and your child while you're here with me? Important events in families, cultures, how they discipline, what that looks like in everybody's home. Really learn about their cultural background and understand it. Family traditions. What needs do they have? Yeah. 
Oh, I love this one. What are the, what kind of conversations do you have with your children at home about their day? Beautiful. Understanding family priorities and their needs. Absolutely. So important. Traditions, hobbies, pastimes that bring them joy. I love that, Julie. Yes. What does your family like to do for fun, right? The more you know this personal and intimate and real stuff of the families, the more you can pull from that and bring it into the classroom space. And the more then it's really, there are this very natural and strong bridge between children's two worlds. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, keep dropping those ideas into chat and I'm gonna move us forward and we're gonna move on um, to another strategy. So one way we can help children internalize positive and affirming messages about bilingualism and multilingualism is by making sure those languages are not only present in the classroom, but integrated into the instruction. This is particularly important in English instructed classes where English is the dominant language, right? We heard that also in the video. This is one of those pieces we simply cannot do without the partnership of families. So this next strategy, families as language experts, both helps to build strong family school partnerships and requires that you are already fostering that partnership. When positioning families as language experts, several things occur. Educators begin to build those strong family school partnerships. They develop positive, the class is developing positive attitudes about multilingualism. And the teachers are modeling being lifelong learners outside their children, curious and excited about learning new languages. It also ends up shaping the curriculum, right? What the families are offering becomes part of that learning. And in turn, this offers a reflection of the children's worlds in the classroom. We want the complexity and beauty of children's various identities to have a place in the classroom. And language experts is a natural entry point for making this happen. Given the language sits nestled within a broader culture, teachers want to bring forth not only the language of their families, but the distinct and colorful and nuanced cultures of them as well. It is super important that teachers are careful not to clump all speakers of one language into a single category, right? So for example, Spanish speaking families from Mexico, El Salvador and Argentina all have distinct language and cultural differences. So again, this requires the teachers engage with families to learn what it is they would like to share about their language and culture, what they wanna to bring to um, these young people. One way to recognize these distinctions is by learn, leaning into the book and song recommendations families make and feel good about, right? This is a space educators want to follow the lead of families. Books and whose stories are reflected and not reflected matter. So as Chimimanda Adichie, a noted Nigerian author, who talks about the danger of representing people in books through a very limited lens, reminds us, anytime books are used in the classroom, they are teaching children about who is and who is not important, valued, real, whose story matters. And so books have the power to really validate and confirm a person's existence as well as do the opposite. People's stories and experiences can be and are often erased by their mere absence. So beyond the sharing of their language, educators can invite them, invite families to share again about customs and traditions related to their culture, family stories, the important foods of their culture. You mentioned some of these already in chat and how wonderful, right, for families to share about the art and artists from their country, about traditional dress and toys and games that children love to play, right? All the things that families are saying are important to them and their family and their community and culture. These sharing opportunities are meant to be low stress for families and a moment of pride for the child and family sharing and a moment of expanding other children's understanding of the world and who makes up the world. So how does language experts work? There are three main steps to implementing the strategy. The teacher first needs to identify all the languages that are represented in the class. This includes the languages the children um, or families may speak, including perhaps parents, grandparents, and other caregivers. 
the interview templates that we just talked about um, can really help you with this. Then the teacher calendars out the languages over the course of the year, expending a minimum of two to three weeks on each language and culture. Even in a classroom primarily of Spanish speakers, there is that beautiful opportunity for the various cultures of the families to be brought forward and honored. And finally, the teacher partners with families to see how, if, if, and how they would like to share with the classroom community. So here are some examples of how drawing on family members as language experts contributed to the languages of the families being an integral part of the classroom. You see here um, a teacher hung this poster up on the front door of the classroom, inviting everyone to share the way that they say hello in their language and in their families. And so just think for a moment about the immediate message that this gives about all languages being welcome and having a place in the classroom. These are images of a bilingual pride activity from a second, third grade combo. And um, this teacher had a diverse classroom with about nine different languages. And she decided to take some small but significant steps to celebrate her students' home language. And these, these what you see here are about me poems, her students um, paired with self-portraits. And then next to them, she had them fill out their ribbons, proud speaker of, including the languages that they already speak, as well as those that they're learning. And so for our youngest children, right, this, this kind of um, story sharing or this working on poems would happen through draw and dictate. So here's another uh, close up example from that wall of Emily. All right. So this next example, we see um, children doing interviews of family members to discuss the benefits of being bilingual. So on the left hand side, you see, um, yep, that's the interview, excuse me. And we always encourage students to um, do this activity in their home language, do any activity that they're doing with families in their home language, where um, families can express themselves the most deeply and fully. Right, and on the right side is an example of a bilingual identity poem where children shared what it meant to them to be bilingual. Their poems were based on a poem by Alma Flor Ada. Right, and again, these can happen at home, they can happen in school with the youngest children um, doing it through dictation. So imagine again how powerful it would be to invite family members to also write their own bilingual identity poem and to share those with their children and the conversations that would follow. And finally, we have some really lovely photos of family members coming in and reading to their children in their home language. So every Friday morning at drop off, families were invited to stay for family read time, 20 minutes in which family members read to their children often in their home language. The library in this classroom had a really diverse set of books and the teacher was really uh, intentional about finding books that represented, that were in families' home languages to the best of her ability. As we talked about earlier with language experts, you can also expand on this idea and then invite families to read a book to the entire class. And the purpose isn't for every child to understand the story in its entirety, but rather for families' languages to be integrated and celebrated. Okay, I'm gonna ask you right now, um, if you have a piece of paper and pen, you can do this next to you, or you can do this in your head, but I'm gonna give you a moment to make a mental or on the paper list of all the languages that are spoken in your classroom. And so just think about who makes up your classroom if you don't have paper and it's helpful to list it, you can do it in chat too, if that's easier than thinking about it. Just make the list physically. And as you're thinking about these, oh, great. Folks are writing them in, great. Oh, and all these dialects. Mm -hmm. So as you are kind of making your list in your mind, I want you to now think about and identify two or three family members 
that you have been able to connect with this year and that you feel comfortable asking to partner with you as language experts, right? Who, who can you start this work with? And if this is new, like reaching out to families and inviting them to do work around being language experts in the class, it's helpful to start with families that you feel already in relationship to. And so that ask isn't as hard. Right. And of course, the goal is to invite all families into the classroom in this way, but the first step is just getting it going. So start with those that you have the strongest relationship with, and then you can start to push yourself to connect with other families in this way, as well as perhaps ask families to support you in connecting with other families about this work. Right. Like, again, another layer of that partnership is getting families to pull other families in and feeling, helping them feel like it's their space as well. Great. Um, so I'm going to return to the multilingual learners toolkit and um, just I just want to flag for you that you'll find this strategy um, write up and the template and a template that you can use under several topics under um, family engagement. So once one place that you can find it is under family engagement 1A, but it, you can find it throughout. Um, this toolkit. I just want to um, acknowledge that somebody in chat a couple moments ago just expressed how hard it is that she's in a bi or they're in a bilingual program and that families aren't speaking their home language. They're not speaking Spanish. And I just want to say that that is where what we see so often, right? And so and so it goes back to this work of what it means to be a home language advocate and engage in conversations about that. Like what's what's going on behind that decision? And can we explore some other options? Can I offer you some actually recent research that might counter some thoughts, right? And really being an ongoing conversation while respecting where they are. So I just wanted to validate, yes, yes, this is really common, which is why one of our big jobs is to be home language advocates and to like really get in there and have those conversations. All right, I'm gonna hand the floor back over to Patricia. Thank you, Corey. Okay, um, so we are going to move into the next strategy that we'll be sharing. And um, that again, just further supports really this family school partnership. And that is family conversations and projects. Um, this particular strategy just provides wonderful opportunities for families to contribute and build on what is happening in the classroom. So you'll find both a detailed strategy overview, as well as a just amazing video that showcases both the children and families taking part in sharing the family school conversations and projects. So I really invite you to get onto the toolkit and watch that because it's just, I think um, seeing it in this video just speaks to the power of implementing uh, this particular strategy. So you'll find that under family engagement, 1D and 1E. But as I said, family conversations and projects um, begin at the school. This work begins at the school, but then flows into the home and is then returned to the classroom where spaces are provided for children and families to share and expand everyone's learning. And the purpose really of family conversations is, is to empower families to capitalize on the use of their home language in meaningful ways while supporting children's positive identity development. And although we have spoken much about the language and culture so far, we do want to acknowledge that there are many other aspects of identity that children bring with them to the classroom, including um, different family structures, right? Nationality or perceived race, economic class, religion, gender, um, different physical abilities, and then all those other invisible factors that also um, come into play impacting who these young children are and may include things such as having a family member who has a severe health issue or um, someone who's been having an incarcerated parent or a parent that may be separated due to immigration status. So it's important for you to look for ways to validate these various aspects of their identity and, and provide opportunity for children to talk about and share who they are at home with their families and in your learning spaces. 
So here are three examples of projects that were anchored in family conversations and projects. And really none of this would be possible without active participation of family members. So family conversations and projects are teacher initiated prompts and activities that are meant to be simple, but encourage families to spend time actively talking and interacting with one another. And these conversations are, are meant to be engaging and joyful and, and bring the families together. So it's important that the prompts be open-ended, that they not require families to have like very specific detailed knowledge um, or experience with the particular topic or, or subject. And because these, um, excuse me, because these um, interactions support children's vocabulary and oral language development, we really want families talking with their children in a language they feel comfortable with and can easily express themselves using rich descriptive language. So as educators, you know, you really want to encourage and support families to engage in these conversations in their home language and, and explain to them why it's so important that they do so. So since names are such an important part of who we are and our identity, we're gonna share just an example of how classroom experiences and family conversations can, can help children explore this topic in a deep and thoughtful manner. As I'm sure you're all very well aware, there are so many rich and wonderful books written for children out there that can be used to talk about the importance of names and emotions and the stories behind their names. Earlier in the chat, I believe it was Erin who referenced this book. And actually this is one of our favorites too, that we definitely recommend you using this um, specifically for this work, Alma and how she got her name. And what's great about this book too, is that it's simple text. So it's available in both English and Spanish, but I saw so many different languages um, in the chat coming up that you could easily translate or, or get support to translate this text into those um, many diverse languages. So as I've said, um, it does a beautiful job at drawing attention to the feelings and stories behind our names and how they form an important part of our identity. So this is a story of a little girl who, you know, doesn't really care for her name because she thinks it's too long. So I'm gonna read just a few pages so you get a sense of the story. So this is Alma and how she got her name. Alma Sofia Esperanza Jose, pura candela, had a long name, too long if you asked her. My name is so long, daddy, it never fits, Alma said. Come here, he said. Let me tell you the story of your name, then you decide if it fits. Sofia, was your grandmother, he began. She loved books, poetry, jasmine flowers, and of course, me. She was the one who taught me how to read. I love books and flowers. You, Daddy, I am Sophia. And one by one, the father continues sharing the story behind each of her names. And as Alma hears the story, she's able to make a personal connection to each name and her feelings towards her name begin to change. And at the very end, she states, Alma Sofia, Esperanza Jose, Pura Candela. That's my name. I am Alma and I have a story to tell. So you can imagine just the rich conversations that can take place in the classroom with opportunities for children to reflect on how Alma was feeling about her name at the beginning of the story, and then how those feelings changed as she learned about those important individuals and her ancestors for whom she was named after, as well as other opportunities for children to reflect on their own names and the feelings they might have about their names. And then of course, a wonderful extension to this classroom experience would be for children to go home and learn the story behind their name. So as a bridge to this read aloud in class discussion, you would prepare your children for what would be a family conversation by sharing the story of your own name. So the following day, you'd read the book again and share the story of your name using visuals wherever possible, or in my case, as appropriate. So 
shared this before with others, but I have an interesting story behind my name. I'm the youngest of three. So if you're the youngest, you know how that story goes. My brother Jaime was named after my father. My sister Guadalupe was named after my grandmother. And I was named after Patricia Hurst, the American heiress and bank robber who was constantly making headline news during the mid 70s when I was born. So uh, my father loved gangster movies. And although he didn't wish a life of crime for me by any means, he definitely was fascinated by your story. So if I was in the classroom working with young children, I may adapt, you know, I'd probably adapt my story a bit. But since we're here, all adults, uh, I figured I'd share the true story behind my name. After modeling at the story of your name, you'd let the children know just how excited you are to learn about the stories behind their names and ask them to go home and learn from families the story behind their names, encouraging them to engage in these conversations in their home language. And here's an example of what the simple strategy could look like, right? This family conversation prompt. So as you can see, it asks families to talk with their child about the story behind their name and to write it down. And it's amazing how such a short and simple activity really creates the opportunity for meaningful conversations to occur between the child and the family, which is why, again, it's so important that prompts and instructions be translated into the home languages of the families so that everyone is um, understands the task at hand and is able to participate. An extension to this family conversation could be to turn it into a family project, which is the same thing, right? It just elaborates it a little bit more. So asking families to not only write the story behind their child's name, but work together with the children to add drawings or self-portraits, decorate it a little bit. Perhaps they'll share a photo that could be printed either at home or school. And, and of course, this work could be even further extended with families at home by, by having them share the stories behind their own names or of other family members too. And then the powerful element behind this strategy really is creating spaces for families to come into the classroom and to share their stories alongside their children. And as this happens, you know, be sure to designate a space in the classroom where you can display their amazing work so that children and families see themselves reflected, honored, and valued. We want to be mindful um, that some children and families, in case perhaps of adoption or foster care, for example, they may not know the story of the child's name. So another option for a family conversation or project could be to invite families to create an I am called web with their child focusing on all the names, the nicknames or terms of endearment that they hear in their current family situation. Again, being sure to first model for the children by sharing your own web and then sending home instructions for families to be able to create one together. So we are at the end of our time together. These are the three instructional practices and strategies that we've shared with you this afternoon. Um, we discussed the importance of strong family school partnerships and particularly the important work of being home language advocates and engaging in conversations with families about the benefits of home language development. We also talked about centering families as language experts and looked at different ways to ensure children's languages are present in the classroom. And then we also just shared uh, how to use family conversations and projects to explore different aspects of children's identity. So we'd love for you to take a moment to reflect and type into the chat, what's the one strategy um, you've learned today or perhaps reinforce something that you're doing in the classroom and you just wanna make sure that you experiment or emphasize it more so in these upcoming three weeks. So if you can please drop that into the chat. Great, so the story of children's names, having them share that with the class, the names in terms of endearment poster, absolutely. What am I called and by who? 
excellent family projects with names. Partnering with families to be language advocates and really thinking, how is it that you're going to start? What piece of information, you know, starting small and then just continuing to grow from there. So it's an ongoing conversation. How to say hello. So having some of those charts available in the classroom or even still, we're still kind of in this kind of post COVID in the mix kind of uh, situation. So you can definitely have some of those um, charts available maybe outside also. So as families do drop their children off, if they're not allowed to come into the classrooms yet, they can still engage in that um, activity. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing all of those um, examples of what you'll be trying next. I do want to remind you that this is the first of three sessions that we will be presenting. We'll be delivering this webinar once again on March 15th in Spanish. So please let your colleagues know if they weren't able to attend today, but would love to um, hear this information in Spanish for them to attend on that day. We have a few minutes. So Carolyn, not sure if there's any questions that um, we can sort of take some time to answer at this time. Yes, thank you so much, Patricia. Um, we do have a couple of minutes left, so please feel free to add any questions that you might have for our presenters, and we can answer those in the in the last couple of minutes that we have. And we also saw that you had asked, asked a few in the Q&A box um, related to the recording and the materials. So we'll be sending those out afterwards to all registered participants. So you'll be getting those in your inbox in, in a few days. And, and I know that join Jen... us, come join us for the other <laughs> two because they're gonna build on each other. All of these yeah. sessions really build beautifully on each other. And Jen keeps dropping the link there to the multilingual learning toolkit. It really is an amazing um, toolkit. Early Edge did a phenomenal job in, in partnering with um, many organizations, researchers and so forth, and just getting the best that they could um, for you to be able to, to really support multilingual learners. So do be sure to explore all those resources. Yes, and thank you. So it looks like we don't have any additional questions. So just wanted to say thank you once again to our incredible presenters for sharing these great strategies and resources. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. Um, and again, this is part one of a three part series. So we really hope that you can join us for the additional sessions that we have planned. And our next one is going to be on focused on oral language development on April 21st. So we hope to see you there. Um, and then we'll also be dropping in the chat an evaluation survey. So please fill that out, take the time to fill that out. Um, and then we'll also be sending you uh, in your inboxes, the webinar recording and materials, as well as a certificate of attendance. So wanted to just say thank you once again to everyone and have a great evening. Thank you so much, Carolyn, for having us. Bye, everyone.